Hi guys, welcome back to ETC 2410, your all-time favorite Monash unit. Yeah, it must, be, must have been very difficult for you to be without any econometrics lectures for two weeks. Well, the good news is that your hell is over and today you can again begin indulging yourself in your passion for econometrics. So today, um, we're going to spend the lecture talking about something called heteroscedasticity. So I'm going to give you a warning right now that at the end of the semester there will be an oral exam and you will be tested on whether or not you can pronounce the word heteroscedasticity. And there will also be a spelling exam and you'll be tested on whether or not you can spell heteroscedasticity. So let's recap what we've done so far in the semester the main results that we have derived. We've studied the multiple linear regression model, that is, a model in which the um, parameters appear raised to the power of one. So this model is linear in the parameters because the betas all appear raised to the power of one. We don't have the log of beta one or the square root of beta two or anything of that nature. And we've also seen that this model is not as restrictive as it might first appear because even though the model has to be linear in the parameters, you can have nonlinear transformations of the dependent variable, such as log y, and you can have nonlinear transformations of the regressors, such as x squared or log of x. So under the assumptions that the model is linear in the parameters, and the assumption that the conditional mean of the error vector is equal to a null vector, and that the columns of x are linearly independent, then we saw that under these three assumptions, the OLS estimator of beta hat is an unbiased, the OLS estimator of beta hat is an unbiased estimator of beta. That is, the expected value of beta hat is equal to the true vector beta. Whoa! We also saw that if we make some additional assumptions, then we can derive some more properties of the OLS estimator. So we saw that if we assumed that the sample is random or that the errors are serially uncorrelated and we assume that the errors are homoscedastic, under those additional assumptions, we can show that the OLS estimate, estimator beta hat is not just an unbiased estimator, but it is the best linear unbiased estimator. It's the most efficient linear unbiased estimator. And that proposition is known as the Gauss-Markov theorem. So under assumptions one to three, the OLS estimator beta hat is an unbiased estimator of beta. And under assumptions one to four, the OLS estimator is the best linear unbiased estimator of beta. In addition, under assumptions one to four, we saw that the variance of the OLS estimator beta hat is equal to sigma squared x prime x inverse, where sigma squared is the variance of the error term. <coughs> so if in addition to that, those four assumptions, we then made the assumptions that the errors are normally distributed, then we saw that conditional on x the OLS estimator is also normally distributed. And some of you might be thinking, well, who gives a rat's ass whether, the OL, whether beta hat is normally distributed or not? Well, the reason we give a rat's ass is that because beta hat is normally distributed, we're able to derive um, T statistics and F statistics for testing linear restrictions on the parameters of the model. So today, um, we're going to relax assumption four. Remember, uh, and specifically, we're going to relax the assumption that the errors are homoscedastic. So let me remind you what it means for the errors to be homoscedastic. Sorry, just checking this microphone is working. I'm paranoid it's gonna drop out on me. So uh, the assumption that the errors are homoscedastic, that's the assumption that the variance of u1 equals sigma squared, the variance of u2 equals sigma squared, the variance of un equals sigma squared. So all of the errors in, the, in our model 
have the same variance sigma squared. That's the assumption of homoscedasticity. And that assumption is necessary in order to prove that the OLS estimator is blue. So today, we're going to um, relax the assumption that the errors are homoscedastic. And we're going to ask ourselves, if we relax the assumption of homoscedasticity and allow the errors to be heteroscedastic, what are the consequences of that for the OLS estimator and for hypothesis testing based on OLS estimation? So the first question we're going to address is, what are the consequences of having heteroscedastic errors? The next thing we're going to ask ourselves is, well, how the hell do we know whether or not the errors are heteroscedastic? And we're going to discuss two tests for heteroscedasticity. One is called the broich pagan test, and the other is called the White test. So at step one, we're going to ask ourselves, what are the consequences of heteroscedasticity? At step two, we're going to ask ourselves, how the hell do we detect heteroscedasticity? And thirdly, we're going to say, well, if we detect the presence of heteroscedasticity, what the hell can we do about it? And you'll see that we have two options. Option number one is to accept that the OLS estimator is inefficient. So continue to estimate by OLS. Accept that the OLS estimator will be inefficient. Uh, but modify our test statistics so that the test statistics are reliable even in the presence of heteroscedasticity. That's option number one, and that's by far the most common way of dealing with hetero. Option number two is to get rid of OLS, kick the poor old OLS estimator into the bushes, and use an alternative estimator uh, known as, some, as a feasible GLS estimator. And a special case of feasible GLS is uh, weighted least squares. OK, <laughs> so that's the agenda for today. But before we embark on that agenda, I wanted to draw your attention to something here. This is a, a piece of art. So this is a very famous Irish artist called Paddy da Vinci. And I paid a huge sum of money for Paddy to create this beautiful piece of art here. So what the hell is this piece of art saying? Well, here's our linear regression model up here. Sorry, I forgot you can't see my pointer, so I'd better go and sit down here. So here's our linear regression model. So imagine that we take the variance on both sides of this conditional on x. So obviously, taking conditional variances on both sides of this equation, I get that the conditional variance of y will be equal to the conditional variance of x times beta plus u. Now since we're conditioning on x, guys, Obviously, x times beta is constant. And so the variance of x times beta, the conditional variance of x times beta plus u is just going to be the conditional variance of u. So here we have this important, but obvious, but important result. But the conditional variance of y is equal to the conditional variance of u. In other words, assumptions we make about the conditional variance of the errors um, are equivalent to making assumptions about the conditional variance of the dependent variable y. Choosing a model for the condition, since the conditional variance of y is exactly the same as the conditional variance of u, choosing a model for y, uh, sorry, choosing a model for the conditional variance of u is exactly the same as choosing a, a model for the conditional variance of y. So if I assume that the errors are homoscedastic, so that the variance of u1 equals the variance of u2 equals the variance of un, that's equivalent to assuming that the variance of y1 equals the variance of y2 equals the variance of yn. So obviously throughout this whole discussion, we're going to be talking about the variance of y conditional on x or the variance of u conditional on x. So it's a pain in the ass for me to keep saying conditional all the time. So I'll just talk about the variance of y and the variance of u, but it will be understood that at all times I'm talking about the con variance of y conditional on x, the variance of u 
Now I could hear you guys saying, well, why the hell do we need to know that stuff in red? Why are you an, uh, annoying us with that piece of information? And the reason that this is worth paying attention to is, if you put me up against the wall and point a gun to my head and say to me, John, is it reasonable to assume that the, var the variance of u1 is the same as the variance of u2? Well, I have no idea whether or not that's reasonable because I have no intuition about the behavior of the errors. On the other hand, if you push me up against the wall, point a gun at my head and say, John, is it reasonable to assume that the variance of y1 is the same as the variance of y2? That is a question that I might have some intuition about. Because I have a lot more intuition about what's reasonable to assume about the dependent variable than I do about what's reasonable to assume about the errors. Okay, so heteroskedasticity arises when the variance of the error term is not constant across observations, or equivalently, when the variance of the dependent variable y is not constant across observations. <clears throat> so very often when we are working with cross-section data, um, it isn't plausible to assume that the variance of the dependent variable is constant across observations. So let's take a simple example. Suppose that um, yi represents expenditure on dining out by household I over the last year. So Y1 is expenditure on dining out over the last year for household one. Y2 is, the, is expenditure on dining out over the last year for household two. So is it reasonable to assume that the variance of Y1 is equal to the variance of Y2? Well, let's suppose that Household one is a low-income household. Well, low-income households, like mine, don't have a lot of discretionary expenditure. They don't spend very much on dining out, and there isn't much variation across low-income households in expenditure on dining out for the simple reason they don't have much discretionary income in the first place. Suppose household two is a high-income household. Well, households with high income have a lot of discretionary um, income, and so the variation in expenditure on dining out for high income households is likely to be quite wide. So assuming that the variation in expenditure across the population on dining out across the population of low income households is the same as the variance in expenditure on dining out across the population of high income households is not a realistic assumption. So in determining whether or not the assumption of heteroskedasticity is reasonable, your first port of call is really common sense. Think about the nature of the dependent variable and whether or not it's reasonable to assume that the variance of the dependent variable is going to be constant across observations. In many applications with cross-section data, it's very um, implausible to assume that the variance in the dependent variable is the same across observations. So that's the first port of call, common sense. And there are a few other examples that Fashid has given you here, so I'll just leave you to read those guys, those examples on your own, and we will move on. So here's a picture. A picture's worth a thousand words. So going back to my um, example, Let's say that y, the dependent variable, represents expenditure on dining out in the last year. And let's say x represents household income. So x1 would be, say, obviously x1, let's say x1 is low income, x2 is middle income, x3 is high income. So this is the probability distribution for the dependent variable conditional on x taking on the value x1. This is the probability the probability distribution of the dependent variable condition, conditional on x taking on the value x2. And of course, this is the probability distribution of the dependent variable conditional on x taking on the value x3. So going back to my example, we can think of this as being the variance, in, so the variance of this distribution 
is going to measure the variance in expenditure on dining out across for, for the population of low-income households. And this guy up here, the variance of this distribution, that's the variance in expenditure on dining out for the population of high-income households. And you can see here that as income is increasing, the variance of each of these distributions is increasing as well. So if we go back and we look at the assumptions we had a while ago, we only need assumptions one, two, and three to prove that the OLS estimator is unbiased. So relaxing the assumption of homoscedasticity has no effect on the unbiasedness of the OLS estimator. So to, as you can see from these three assumptions here, we don't need to assume uh, homoscedasticity in order to show that the OLS estimator is unbiased. So allowing the errors to be heteroscedastic has no effect on the unbiasedness of the OLS estimator. However, when we look at assumption four, we see that we do need the assumption of homoscedasticity to prove that the OLS estimator is the best linear unbiased estimator. So this is, when you're thinking about um, heteroscedasticity, the consequences of heteroscedasticity, there are two consequences to consider. The first one is what are the consequences of hetero for the properties of the OLS estimator? That's question number one. Question number two, what are, is the, what are the consequences of heteroscedasticity for our standard hypothesis tests, our t-tests and our f-tests? It turns out that um, if the errors are heteroscedastic, or equivalently, if the dependent variable is heteroscedastic, then uh, that has consequences both for the properties of the OLS estimator, but also for the reliability of our standard um, hypothesis tests of linear restrictions on the parameters of our model. So looking at the consequences of heteroscedasticity for the properties of the OLS estimator first, we see that hetero has no effect on the unbiasedness of the OLS estimator. So the OLS estimator is unbiased as long as assumptions one, two, and three hold. So if assumptions one, two, and three hold and the errors are heteroscedastic, the OLS estimator will still be unbiased. However, we do need the assumption of homoscedasticity to prove that the OLS estimator is the best linear unbiased estimator. So here is the first consequence of hetero. If the errors are hetero, or equivalently the dependent variable is hetero, the OLS estimator is no longer the best linear unbiased estimator. And furthermore, the formula for the variance of the OLS estimator is no longer given by sigma squared x prime x inverse. And that's pretty obvious here, right? Because sigma squared here, that's supposed to be the common variance of the errors. But when you have heteroscedasticity, you have no common variance, right? You've got sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, sigma 3 squared, blah, blah, blah. So this can't possibly be the correct formula for the variance of beta hat. So as far as the properties of the OLS estimator are concerned, if, the, if we have heteroscedasticity, the OLS estimator is still unbiased, but it's no longer the best linear unbiased estimator, and the formula for the variance of beta hat is no longer given by sigma squared x prime x inverse. So that's the consequence of hetero for the properties of the OLS estimator. What about the implications of hetero for hypothesis testing? Well, this is really the most serious consequence of heteroscedasticity. Because the variance of beta hat is no longer equal to sigma squared x prime x inverse, the usual OLS standard errors reported by statistical packages like eViews will no longer be correct. So the OLS standard errors are no longer um, correct when we have heteroscedasticity. Those OLS standard errors have been derived under the assumption that the errors are homoscedastic. And if we have heteroscedasticity, that means that those OLS standard errors are no longer valid. And that means, guys, that beta j hat divided by the OLS standard error of beta j hat no longer has a t-distribution. 
So our uh, hypothesis tests are unreliable. We think beta hat divided by the standard error of beta hat has a t distribution. We run off to the t tables to get our critical value. We think we're testing now at the 5% significance level, but our test statistic doesn't have a t distribution at all. So that's the most serious implication of heteroscedasticity. The standard hypothesis tests based on the OLS standard errors are no longer reliable, even in large samples. So this is not a small sample problem. This is not a problem that goes away as the sample size goes off to infinity. So heteroscedasticity uh, does have really quite serious implications for hypothesis testing. The usual uh, test statistics um, based on OLS standard errors no longer have the postulated distribution and therefore our hypothesis tests are unreliable even in large samples. So that's, those are the consequences of hetero. The next thing we uh, want to do is uh, talk about detecting hetero. So how do we determine whether or not we have heteroscedasticity in the model? Well, again, as I've already mentioned, the first port of call is just common sense. Think about the nature of the dependent variable and whether or not it makes sense to assume that the variance of the dependent variable is constant across observations. In the dining out example, common sense would tell us that it's not reasonable to assume that the variance of the dependent variable is going to be the same for high income households as it is for low income households. So in that example, assuming heteroscedasticity, sorry, assuming homoscedasticity would not be plausible. We would definitely have heteroscedasticity. Another thing that we can do is we can look at the scatter uh, plot of the dependent variable and each of the regressors. So in this example here, we have the scatter plot between income and food. So food is the dependent variable, income is one of the regressors. So we can see, looking at the scatter plot here, that as income increases, the variance of expenditure on food is starting to increase as well. And at high income levels, the variance in expenditure on food in our sample is quite high. So this, of course, the scatter plot is only telling us about what's going on in the sample, not necessarily what's going on in the population. So we can see in our sample that as income increases, variation in the dependent variable increases as well. And you can look at the scatter plot for food and each of the regressors and see if there's any evidence that in your sample, the variation in the dependent variable is changing as the value of the regressor changes. So here we have three very good looking young men. So girls, if I had to ask you to marry one of these guys, which one would you choose? It's not an easy question. So these guys, um, this fellow here, this is Trevor Broish, this guy is Adrian Pagan, and this guy is Hal White. So Broish and Pagan are Australian econometricians, and they developed a test for heteroscedasticity, which they very modestly called the Broish Pagan test. So this guy, Adrian Pagan, is a very, he's probably the most, uh, probably the greatest ever Australian econometrician. He's not just an econometrician, he's a macro economist, and he's probably in his 70s now, and he's very famous. I, I had heard of him before I ever came to Australia, and he's taught at universities all over the world, including Oxford and the top US universities. And he's not just an econometrician, he's also a distinguished macro economist as well. So Broich and Pagan came up with a test for heteroscedasticity, which we're going to talk about shortly. And then the other test we're going to talk about is White's test for heteroscedasticity. And this guy here is Hal White. Um, yeah, so he's a very famous econometrician. Uh, unfortunately, he died about maybe three or four years ago when he was in his early 60s. But had he lived, he would undoubtedly have been the next econometrician to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Because as you will see, when we start talking about the uh, remedies for heteroscedasticity, he made a very, very important um, contribution. 
it's very, normally in economics, they don't award anybody the Nobel Prize unless they're at over 60. And so many of the recipients are in their 70s when they get the Nobel Prize. So some people miss out because they're not able to stay around long enough. And it's, often it's very well known that somebody in the profession is going to get the Nobel Prize eventually. So for example, everybody knew that Paul Krugman was going to get the Nobel Prize eventually. We knew that because of his very original contribution to international trade theory. And there's another macroeconomist, a guy called Robert Lucas, and everybody knew that he was going to win the Nobel Prize eventually. So um, when he and his wife divorced, his wife had a clause inserted in the divorce settlement. Excuse me. What's going on here? No, this is a hazard. I'm putting in a hazard. Yeah, so his wife had a clause inserted in the divorce contract stipulating that if he won the Nobel Prize within five years, she'd get 50%. So the Nobel Prize is worth a million dollars, so 50% is quite a lot. And she was a very prescient woman because about three years after they divorced, he did indeed win the Nobel Prize, and she got half a million bucks. So this guy, Hal, if he had stayed around long enough, I think it's almost certain he would have won the Nobel Prize. Okay, enough gossiping. Let's get on with it. So here's the Broich-Pagan um, test. So here's our linear regression model. The i observation on the dependent variable, the i observation on each of the regressors, the i observation on the error term. So in order to perform the Broich-Pagan test, you have to make an assumption about what's generating the heteroscedasticity in your model. So let me go back to my own notes here, sorry. So, so here's the Broich-Pagan test where we just have got uh, two variables. So to do, perform the Broich-Pagan test, you have to make an assumption about what's causing the heteroscedasticity in your model. So here, I have assumed that the variance of the error term depends on two variables, Z1 and Z2. Obviously, so sigma i squared will be delta naught plus delta 1 times Zi1 plus delta 2 times Zi2. So obviously, as i changes, the values of the z variables are going to change, and therefore the error variance is going to change as well. So that's one of the, that's an important point to appreciate. But to perform this broch godfrey test, you have to make an assumption about what's generating the heteroscedasticity in the model. So a reasonable question for you guys to ask would be, well, where the hell do you get these z variables from? Typically, guys, these z variables will be uh, a subset of the regressors, or indeed, sometimes, all of the regressors. Now, under the null hypothesis, the errors are homoscedastic. So this is typical of econometrics. The null hypothesis for hypothesis testing generally assumes that everything in the garden is rosy. No problems, nothing to see here. Move on, folks. So the null is that the errors are homoscedastic. In other words, that the error variance is constant. So the null hypothesis is that delta 1 equals delta 2 equals 0. Obviously, if delta 1 and delta 2 are both equal to 0, then sigma uh, squared i is just equal to delta naught, and we're back in the world of homoscedasticity. So the, under the null hypothesis, the errors are homoscedastic. And then the alternative hypothesis is that at least one of these delta, either delta 1 or delta 2 are both are not equal to zero. So under the alternative, the errors are heteroscedastic. So I'll just go back to Fashid's lecture notes. Hold on a moment. Let me check that the mic is working. Whoa. The mic is trying to get away from me. 
Okay, so as I say, usually these z variables will be a subset of the x's, or sometimes they are all of the x's. Now, in principle, one or more of these z variables doesn't have to be one of the regressors in your model. In principle, I could have z1 here, uh, say a variable z1, which is not one of the regressors. But in practice, that's highly unlikely because uh, our, the problem here is that it, this um, assumes we know a hell of a lot about the behavior of the error term. So normally, uh, the best we can do is assume that the heteroscedasticity is being generated by one of the regressors in the model or indeed all of them. In the example I gave you of dining out, uh, common sense would suggest that the variance of expenditure on dining out is going to vary with household income. So in that case, an obvious variable to choose as one of your Zs would be household income. So at step one, we specify a model for the heteroscedasticity. This is our model here. Under the null hypothesis, delta 1 equals delta 2 equals delta Q equals 0. So we, um, first of all, at step 1, we estimate our linear regression model by OLS. And we get the OLS residuals ui hat. So we're obviously interested in the variance of the error term, right? Now remember, under the assumption that the error term has a conditional mean of zero, the expectation of ui squared is just the variance of ui. So we don't observe the ui's, so we replace them with the OLS residuals that we get when we estimate our linear regression model. So at step one, we estimate our linear regression model by OLS, and we get the OLS residuals ui hat. Then at step two, we regress ui hat squared on a constant and the variables that we've chosen as our z's. And we estimate that regression by OLS. So this is called an auxiliary regression. So in econometrics, an auxiliary regression is a regression in which you're not intrinsically interested you just, you're just estimating it to get a statistic to enable you to do something else. So here, for example, when we regress ui hat squared on the z's, we don't give a rat's ass what the estimated coefficients are. We're only, doing, we're only performing this regression to get the or squared. So this is an example of an auxiliary regression. It's a regression that you don't have any intrinsic, intrinsic interest in. You're just running the regression to get a statistic to help you do something else. So at step two, we regress the squared or less residuals on a constant and the z's, and we get the or squared from this regression. Now, Broich and Pagan proved mathematically that when the null hypothesis is true, i.e. when the errors are homoscedastic, n times the or squared that we get at step two has a chi-squared distribution with Q degrees of freedom in large samples. So that's, that was the, that's the really um, tricky thing to, the, that's the, the tricky part of the Broich Pagan test. That's, they were able to show that under the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity, n times the R squared you get at step two as a chi squared distribution with Q degrees of freedom asymptotically where Q is the number of Zs that you have in your model for homoscedasticity. So in the example I showed you a moment ago, I just had two Zs, Z1 and Z2, so then Q would be equal to 2. If you've got three Zs, Z1, Z2, and Z3, then Q is going to be equal to 3. So um, an important point to know here is that <coughs> Broich and Pagan were able to derive the asymptotic distribution of n times or squared. That is, they were able to prove that as the sample size goes off to infinity, the statistic n times r squared converges to a chi-squared random variable with q degrees of freedom. Interestingly, it's generally speaking much easier to derive the asymptotic distributions of estimators and test statistics, that is, the distribution as t goes off to infinity. Because as you let t go off to infinity, you can appeal to things called 
uh, central limit theorems and weak and strong laws of large numbers which simplify the mathematics enormously. So Reuschen Pagan showed that n times the R squared you get at step two has a chi-squared distribution with q degrees of freedom asymptotically. Now, they were only able to figure out the asymptotic distribution of the test statistic. And that's often the case with hypothesis tests. We can only figure out the asymptotic distribution of the test statistic. That is, the distribution as the sample size goes off to infinity. So what, when we only know the asymptotic distribution of our test statistic, what we do is we use that asymptotic distribution as an approximation to the finite sample distribution. And of course, if you have a small sample size, using the, asympt the, the asymptotic distribution may be a very bad approximation to the finite sample distribution. So tests which are based on the asymptotic distribution of the test statistic can be very unreliable in small samples. So that's something you always need to bear in mind when you only know the asymptotic distribution of your test statistic. So this baby has a chi-square distribution with q degrees of freedom. So if the sample value of our test statistic exceeds the critical value, then we reject the null hypothesis that the errors are homoscedastic. Okay, so I'll just go through those steps one more time. Step one, estimate your linear regression model by OLS and get the OLS residuals ui hat. Step two, regress ui hat squared on a constant and your z variables, and you have chosen these z variables yourself, and get the or squared from that regression. Under the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity, n times the or squared you got at step two, as a chi-square distribution with q degrees of freedom. And then, if the sample value of your test statistic exceeds the critical value, and if you're testing at the 5% significance level, the critical value would be the 95th percentile of a chi-squared variable with q degrees of freedom. So if the sample value of your test statistic exceeds the critical value, you reject the null and say, God damn, we have heteroscedas we have heteroscedastic errors. There's also an F form of the test. As you see when you do this test in eViews, eViews will spit out two test statistics and two p-values. One test statistic is based on this, this statistic here, n times r squared, and you get a p-value for that. Um, the, another way of doing the test is to say, you know what? When I run this regression here of ui hat squared on the z's, under the null hypothesis, the z's are jointly insignificant. Under the null, the z's are jointly insignificant. So I could test the joint significance of the z's by just doing the or squared form of the f test. So that's where this comes from. So here's an example. This example must come from Wildridge because the notation is awful. Yuck! So the dependent variable here, we have net financial, uh, this must be net financial assets because this is net FA, <laughs> net financial assets in thousands of dollars. And the uh, regressors chosen are income, age, and age squared. Okay. So we want to uh, perform the test. So this is our linear regression model. So at step one, we estimate this baby by OLS, and we want to get the OLS residuals so we can run the regression at step two. So when you estimate a linear regression model in eView, she doesn't automatically save the residuals. You have to ask her to save the OLS residuals to give you a permanent um, copy. So you can save the OLS residuals by going procedure, make residuals series, and giving it a name. And then at step two, you run the OLS regression of the squared residuals on a constant and the variables that you've chosen as your x's. So you can go through that two-step procedure uh, if you uh, want to. 
but there is actually the process of conducting a broch pagan test is automated in EDUs. So after we've estimated our linear regression model at step one, if we go um, new residual diagnostics, you see down here we've got heteroscedasticity tests. So when you click on this box here, this is the output that you get. So here is the F form of the test statistic and the associated p-value. And here is the R squared form of the test statistic and the associated p-value. And you can see from these p-values, they're well, well and truly, they're way less than 0.05. So whether we use the F form of the broch pagan test or the R squared form of the broch pagan test, we massively reject the null hypothesis that the errors are homoscedastic. Now, the de when you do this test in eViews, Notice that these are the regressors that were used at step two. So you see this is the output from the step two regression, where the dependent variable is the squared residuals. So again, in case you've forgotten, at step one, we estimate our linear regression model and get the OLS residuals. Then at step two, we regress the residuals squared on our Zs. So here, the Zs that have been chosen by eViews are the regressors from step one income, age, and age squared. And here, at step two, she's chosen as her Z variables, income, age, and age squared. So the default option in eViews, when you perform the broch pagan test, is to use the regressors in your linear regression model as the Zs for your auxiliary regression. You can override this default option if you want to, but that's the default option. So, Fashid has some advice for you here. He says, when learning to do the Broch Pagan test, it's better for you to do the, go through the two step procedure on your own rather than use the inbuilt automated uh, procedure in eViews. And I'm sure that you will all religiously adhere to that good advice. Okie dokie. So, the next test is White's test. This is a, a, an also a test of the null hypothesis that the errors are homoscedastic. But in this case, the alternative hypothesis is different. So instead of assuming that the error variance is a linear function of a bunch of Z variables, Hal White assumed that um, the error variance is some smooth unknown function of the regressors. And White showed that when you regress U hat, so the squared residuals, on a constant, x1 to xk, x1 squared to xk squared, and all pairwise cross products of x1 and xk, um, you can detect this general form of heteroscedasticity. Again, White's test statistic is n times the R squared you get from the residual regression, and under the null hypothesis, it has a chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the number of Zs that you used in your auxiliary regression. So this is a little bit vague. So let me go back and look at um, the difference between the broch pagan test and the White test. So here are my lecture notes here. So here's the broch pagan test with Q is equal to 2. So here I have assumed that the error variance depends on Z1 and Z2. Under the null hypothesis, the errors are homoscedastic, so the null is that delta 1 equals delta 2 equals 0, and the alternative is at least one of these deltas is not equal to 0, in which case the errors are heteroscedastic. So how does that differ from White's test? Well, here's the general form of White's test. So again, I'm assuming here that Q is equal to 2. So I've just got two Zs, Z1 and Z2. And typically, So with the broch pagan test, my auxiliary regression equation just involves regressing the squared residuals on a constant, Z1 and Z2. Uncle Hal, he takes things a little bit far, further. Some people think he takes things too far. So in addition to including Z1 and Z2 as regressors in the auxiliary regression, he also includes Z1 squared, Z2 squared, and the cross products Z1, Z2. 
So in the white test, you have the additional regressors, Z1 squared, Z2 squared, and then all the cross products of your Zs. So I've only got two Zs, so I only have one cross product, Z1 and Z2. If I had three Zs, I'd have Z1 multiplied by Z2, Z1 multiplied by Z3, and Z2 multiplied by Z3. Okay, so that's the difference between the two tests. Obviously, White's test includes all of these additional regressors given by the squares of your Zs and the cross products. So <clears throat> a problem with um, White's test is that when you, if you have a large number of Xs in your linear regression model, and then you cannot end up with a large number of Zs. So you can end up with, if I've got five Xs, and they're going to be my Zs, then I'm going to have five Zs, then I'm going to have five more regressors because I'm including the squares of each of the uh, Zs, and then I have all the cross product times. So when you um, execute the white, and choose to do the white test in Hebrews, the default option is to include the, uh, the Zs, the squares, the Z squares, and the cross products. But if you want to, you can tell Hebrews not to include the cross product terms. Because as you're adding more and more of these Z variables to your auxiliary regression, you're adding, you have more and more coefficients to estimate. So you're reducing your degrees of freedom. So one way of getting around this problem is of having a large number of Zs when you include all of the Z squares and all of the cross product terms is to use the, uh, instead of using all those Zs, is to, in your auxiliary regression, use Y hat and Y hat squared. So a special form of the white test involves regressing the squared OLS residuals on y hat and y hat squared, and using the or squared from this regression to form your test statistic. Again, let's have a look at a specific example. Oh, that didn't work out very well. So it might not be obvious to you why using yi hat and yi hat squared is an alternative to using all of the, to using the, um, the z's and the squares of the z's and all of the cross products. So let's look at a simple example in order to make that a little bit clearer. So suppose I have a linear regression model consisting of two x's, x1 and x2. So I'm going to choose um, as my z variables x1 and x2. So my z1 is just going to be x1, and my z2 is just going to be x2. So at step one, we would regress y on x1 and x2 and get the OLS residuals. And then at step two, this should be a hat, actually this should be the OLS residuals. Um, this, is my, this is my model for the conditional variance. This is Hal White's model for the conditional variance. So the variance of the error term depends on x1, x2, x1 squared, x2 squared, and then the cross products, product x1, x2. So this is Hal White's model for the conditional variance. And obviously, under the null hypothesis, all of these deltas are equal to zero, except for delta naught, in which case the errors would be homoscedastic. So what I'm trying, going to try and show you here is how using y hat and y hat squared is equivalent to having all of these um, x's, the squared x's, and the cross products. So remember that yi hat is beta 1 hat times xi1 plus beta 2 times xi2. yi hat squared is going to be the square of this guy. So if I square this guy, I'm going to get beta 1 hat squared xi1 squared plus beta 2 hat squared xi2 squared blah blah blah. 
So you see how y i hat captures x1 and x2, and then y i hat squared, she captures x1 squared, x2 squared, and the cross product. So if I, if I now choose as my model for the error variance to, uh, so I choose to model sigma i squared as delta naught plus delta one times y i hat plus delta two times y i hat squared. So I now choose this baby to, to be my auxiliary regression. That implies that all of this is true. You see, if you plug in y i hat, y i hat squared, you can see that you end up with all of the x's, the squared x's, and the cross products. So choosing this baby here as my auxiliary regression at step two effectively en enables me to include the x's, the squared x's, and the cross products. However, I only have two variables here. Whereas when I use all of the x's, I've got one, two, three, four, five regressors in my auxiliary regression, where when I use y i hat and y i hat squared, I only have two regressors in my auxiliary regression. So I don't have the same degrees of freedom problem I have if I explicitly include all of the x's, the squared x's, and their cross products. check the mic and it's died it's not working okay I'm going to this big microphone because the other one seems to have died so I'll stick with this one for the time being so we've just discuss the special case of White's test for heteroscedasticity. So now here's the um, example we looked at previously. And, and we want to test for heteroscedasticity in this financial wealth example. And this time in eViews, instead of choosing the broich pagan test, we chose uh, the option white test, as you'll see when you have your computer, when you have your tutorial on heteroscedasticity, both the broich pagan test and the white test are automated in eViews. So in this case, we've told eViews we want to perform the white test for heteroscedasticity. And remember the regressors in the model were income, age, and age squared. So in the white test, he's going to include in his auxiliary regression income, age, and age squared, income squared, age squared, and age squared squared, and then the cross products, income times age, income times age squared, age times age squared, etc. So here's the um, estimated auxiliary regression for White's test. The dependent variable is the residual squared, and then you see here we have all of the regressors. We've got income, age, age squared. We've got income times age and blah, blah, blah. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine regressors in the auxiliary regression. Again, uh, there are two forms of the test. There's the or squared form and there's the F form. So the F form of the test just involves uh, testing the joint significance of these regressors because under the null hypothesis these regressors here are jointly insignificant in the auxiliary regression. So in both cases the p-value is extremely small so whether we use the f form of the white test or the or squared form we massively reject the null hypothesis that the errors are homoscedastic. And again so in this example whether we use the broich pagan test or whether we use the white test, we come to the same conclusion that the errors in our model are heteroscedastic. So, the, okay, so before I go into that, so that's um, one, the general form of the white's test. If you want to use the other form where you use y hat 
and y hat squared. That, that special version of the white test is not automated in eViews, so you have to go through and do the steps yourself. Okay, so we've talked, uh, we've talked about the consequences of heteroscedasticity. We've seen that heteroscedasticity, um, if the errors are heteroscedastic, the OLS estimator is going to be inefficient. And we've also seen that the standard hypothesis tests based upon the OLS standard errors are no longer valid. We've also talked about how we would detect heteroscedasticity. So firstly, we think about, we use common sense and think about whether or not it makes sense to assume that the variance of the dependent variable is constant across observations. And now we have two formal tests, the broch pagan test and the White test that we can use to test for heteroscedasticity. So obviously the next thing is, to, is if we find evidence that the errors are heteroscedastic, what the hell can we do about it? So there are two solutions available. So the first solution uses White's heteroscedastic consistent standard errors. So this is really the big contribution of White. So the thing he's famous for is not his White's test for heteroscedasticity. The thing that um, Hal White is famous for, and the reason he would have won the Nobel Prize if he had stayed alive long enough, is the introduction of um, something called White's heteroscedastic consistent standard errors. So the problem is that the OLS standard errors are based on the assumption that the variance of beta hat is given by sigma squared x prime x inverse. As we've seen, when you have heteroscedasticity, this is no longer the correct formula for the variance of beta hat. And so that's why the standard errors based on this formula are no longer valid and high and test statistics which use those standard errors are no longer reliable. So with heteroscedasticity, the variance of u, and again I emphasize anytime I say variance, it's variance conditional on x. So the variance of u is now allowed to vary across observations. So sigma 1 squared is the variance of the error term for observation 1. Sigma 2 squared is the variance of the error term u2, sigma n squared is the variance of the error term un. So with heteroscedasticity, this is what the variance matrix for the error vector looks like. Under homoscedasticity, we just had a constant sigma squared along the diagonal here. So, the so that's, that's the variance for the error of the error vector u, the variance matrix of the error vector u. What about the variance of the OLS estimator beta hat. Remember beta hat is a k by one vector. So the variance matrix of a vector is going to be a matrix. It's going to be a k by k matrix. So with heteroscedasticity, so the, by, we know that the, the variance of beta hat is x prime x inverse x prime var u by x times x prime x inverse. Under homoscedasticity, for var u, we sub in sigma squared x prime x inverse, and then we get this nice result here, that the variance of beta hat reduces to this nice formula. When I have heteroscedasticity, I can't sub in sigma squared times an identity matrix for var u. Instead, for var u, we have to plug in this um, n by n matrix here. So in this formula here, for var u, I sub in this matrix. And that gets me to here. So what White did is he proved that if we replace sigma 1 squared with the first OLS residual squared, and we replace sigma 2 squared with the second OLS residual squared, and we replace sigma n squared with the nth OLS residual squared, 
this matrix here is a consistent estimator of this matrix up here. Now, I know you haven't, we haven't talked about consistency yet. It's um, an asymptotic property of an estimator, and it's discussed in lecture 12 or 11, 11 or 12, I can't remember. But basically what happens is, as the sample size goes off to infinity, Hal White proved that this matrix here converges to this matrix here. So what the bottom line is, uh, as I say, you haven't been introduced to the concept of consistency yet, so you just need an intuitive understanding of what it means for this baby to be a consistent estimator of this baby. Uh, what it means is that in a very large sample, this matrix here will be extremely close to this matrix here. So what um, um, Hal White demonstrated is that if we use the square root of the elements on the principal diagonal of this matrix to construct our test statistics, for example, in the usual T statistic, we have beta j hat divided by the standard error of beta j hat, where the standard error of beta j hat is based on the usual OLS formula. Hal said, no, guys, don't do that. Divide beta j hat by the square root of the element in row j, column j of this matrix. So standard errors which are based on this matrix here, they're referred to as White's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. And so White showed that if we divide beta j, beta j hat, by White's standard error of beta j hat, then the usual T statistic will be asymptotically valid. It will be valid in large samples. So the thing for which Hal White is famous is he's famous for developing an alternative formula for the standard errors of the beta j's, which when we use them in our test statistics, render those test statistics asymptotically valid. So for example, if we have heteroscedasticity, beta j hat divided by the OLS standard error of beta j hat does not have a T distribution, even asymptotically. Uncle Hal showed that beta j hat divided by Uncle Hal's standard error for beta j hat has a T distribution in large samples. So basically, um, if we find one solution, if, so one thing we can do is, if we find we have heteroscedasticity, we can do the following. We can say, okay, I accept that the OLS estimator is no longer efficient. I can live with that. I'll still estimate my model by OLS. I'll accept that the OLS estimator is no longer efficient. But when it comes to doing hypothesis testing, instead of using the usual OLS standard errors, we're going to use Uncle Hal's standard errors. And if we do that, if we use Uncle Hal's standard errors rather than the OLS standard errors, then the usual test statistics, so beta j hat divided by the um, Uncle Hal standard error for beta j hat, uh, will have a T distribution asymptotically. And so our hypothesis, the hypothesis testing tests that we do using White's standard errors will be reliable and valid in large samples. And that's really the great contribution that Hal White made. He said, gee whiz, if you have heteroscedasticity, don't worry about it. Estimate your linear regression equation by OLS. But when it comes to doing hypothesis testing, don't use the OLS standard errors. Use White's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. If you do that, then your test statistics uh, will be valid. Will and your hypothesis tests will be valid and reliable in large samples. Right? Because remember, there are two consequences when you have heteroscedasticity. 
the OLS estimator is no longer efficient, and hypothesis tests based on the usual OLS standard errors are no longer reliable, even in large samples. Al came along and he said, gee whiz guys, I can't do anything about the inefficiency of OLS, but I've come up with this alternative way of doing hypothesis tests. Basically, instead of using, your, using the standard OLS standard, uh, standard errors, instead of using the conventional OLS standard errors, use White's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors and your hypothesis tests will be reliable in large samples. Whew, that's a lot to say. So whenever you estimate a linear regression equation in eViews, if you click on the options button, it will ask you how, uh, what kind of standard errors do you want to use in your test statistics. Do you, so the default, estimation default, is the usual OLS standard errors. But it gives you the option instead of using White's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. So if you choose the default option, then in constructing the test statistics, eViews will use the usual OLS standard errors. If you choose the white option, then in constructing test statistics, eViews will use white's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. And that's now the conventional way of dealing with heteroscedasticity. Um, it's basically in 99 times out of 100, people will say, okay, I've got heteroscedasticity. I'll estimate by OLS, accept that the OLS estimator is inefficient, but I'll use White's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors, and at least I'll be able to do hypothesis tests which are um, reliable in large samples. As a matter of fact, some people, when they're working with cross-section data, don't even bother testing for heteroscedasticity. They just assume that they're going to have heteroscedasticity and automatically use White's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. When we talk about time series data, you see there's another option here, HAC. This stands for heteroscedasticity autocorrelation consistent standard errors, um, and this is another modification you can make to your standard errors if you have autocorrelation in the errors. And uh, this uh, builds on the work of Hal White, and these HAC standard errors were first introduced to the profession by two guys, one of whom is Newey and the other is West. But in, in, in developing these HAC standard errors, they built on the work of White um, and his development of heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. So here's what happens when we get, so we, we estimate, we're estimating this model again. Um, this is the financial wealth model. The regressors are income, age, and age squared. So when we click on the options button and we choose white, this is the output that we get. Eviews tells you that she's using white's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. And here's the output that we get when we just use the default standard errors. So the first thing to notice is the estimated coefficients are exactly the same. So using white standard errors has no effect on beta hat. You get the same beta hat whether you use the um, OLS standard errors or you choose to use white's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. However, as you would expect, the standard errors are different. These are standard errors based on the usual OLS formula, and these are the standard errors of the beta hats based on the formula provided by Hal White. And of course, because the estimated coefficients are the same, but the standard errors are, this, are different, the t-statistics are going to be different as well. So basically, these test statistics here if, are unreliable if you have heteroscedasticity, even in large samples, whereas these test statistics are um, reliable in large samples, even if you have heteroscedasticity. So in this case here, does it make any difference? I better put my glasses on here. 
So when we use White's heteroscedastic standard errors, income and age squared are statistically significant, and age is not. And downstairs here, we find income and age squared are statistically significant, and age is not. But you can see the p-value for age when we use white standard errors is 0.23, whereas the p-value on age when we use the usual OLS standard errors is um, 0.08. So if we were testing at the 10% significance level, we would, or if indeed we were doing a two-tailed test, we might think that um, either age has no effect on wealth or age has a positive effect. If that were the case, then the, the p-value here would be divided by 2, and this would be 0.04 which would make age statistically significant. Whereas up here, even if we divide this by two, age still wouldn't be statistically significant. And the other statistics you note are not, uh, haven't changed. Um, the R squared is the same in both cases. The F statistic for testing the joint significance of the regressors is the same in both cases. Okay, so that's one solution to heteroscedasticity. Estimate by OLS and use White's heteroscedastic consistent standard errors for your hypothesis tests. And that is now the dominant way of dealing with heteroscedasticity in modern applied econometrics. There's another option available, and that's what we're going to discuss next. How are we doing on time here? Better be, I better get a move on. So solution two, transform the model. So A, logarithmic transformation of Y may do the trick. So basically what uh, the idea here is that if in the population model, the appropriate dependent, var dependent variable is not y, but log y. And instead of using log y as the dependent variable, you chose to use y. So let me try and say that again, because it sounds a bit confusing. So suppose that in the, in the population model, the appropriate dependent variable is not y, but log y. And you, being the silly billy that you are, instead of using log y as the dependent variable, you, you use y, that, mi that mistake may manifest itself in having heteroscedastic errors. In other words, maybe I have heteroscedasticity because silly old me, I used y as the dependent variable when I should have used log y. Well then, if that is true, if you go back and you change the dependent variable and you use log y rather than y as the dependent variable, the heteroscedasticity would go away because it's being caused by the fact you're using y as the dependent variable when you should be using log y. Of course, if that's not the reason for the heteroscedasticity, then using log y rather than y ain't going to achieve nothing. <coughs> so an alternative, so uh, that's one way of transforming the model. Use log y rather than y, but that's only going to work in a very limited number of cases where in Namely, the case it only works in cases where you should have used log y in the first place rather than y. So option B is involves a much more uh, fundamental transformation of the model. And option B is called um, is an example of a, a, an estimator called feasible generalized least squares. So option B is a, a radical option. If we're going to use option B, we're going to abandon the OLS estimator and we're going to use a different estimation procedure. So in general, um, transforming the model, what we're going to do here is we're going to execute two steps. At step one, we're going to transform, okay, so take a step backwards. We're in a situation where we have found evidence that there's heteroscedasticity in the errors. So instead of using OLS, we can use an estimator which is called a feasible generalized least squares estimator or feasible GLS. And 
feasible GLS estimation involves executing the following two steps. At step one, you transform the model in such a way that you get rid of the heteroscedasticity. At step two, you estimate the transformed model by OLS. Because since you have no heteroscedasticity in the transformed model, OLS estimation of the transformed model will be efficient. Now this is most easily understood by looking at um, an example, which we'll do now in a moment. But that's, if you're thinking about uh, feasible GLS estimation, feasible GLS estimation always involves these two steps. At step one, you transform the model so that you get rid of the problem in the error term. And then at step two, you estimate the transformed model by OLS. Okay, let's have a look at an example of this. So here's my linear regression model given by equation one. And the variance of ui, the, you know, again, the conditional variance of ui, is equal to sigma squared times hi, where hi is some function of an observable variable. For example, hi might be equal to xi1, the ith observation on the regressor x1, or it might be xi2 or xik, or it might be xi1 squared. So you have to specify how h1 is determined. So I'll give you a heads up now. This is the problem with feasible GLS. You can see here that I, the researcher, am going to make an absolutely heroic assumption. I'm going to assume that the variance of ui is sigma squared times this variable hi. For example, I might say the variance of ui is sigma squared times hi1. So I'm now making a very strong assumption about what's generating the heteroscedasticity in my model. So this assumes that I know a hell of a lot about the behavior of the error term, that I'm able to make it this strong assumption about what's generating the heteroscedasticity in my model. Going back again to the um, household expenditure on dining out, I might uh, argue based on common sense that a good choice for the variable hi in that model would be household income because I believe that the variance in household expenditure on dining out, um, the variation in the dependent variable is being caused by variation in household income. So at the outset, we have to make a strong assumption about what's causing the heteroscedasticity in the model. We have to nail our colors to a particular mast. So, <clears throat> so I've chosen my variable hi. I have hypothesized or assumed that the variance of ui is given by sigma squared hi. I now define wi to be one over the square root of hi. So this variable wi, Eviews refers to this as the weight variable, or the weighting variable. No, I think it's the weight variable, she calls it. So I'm defining wi to be one over the square root of hi. So now I'm going to execute step one of the two-step procedure. I'm going to transform my linear regression model in such a way that I get rid of the heteroscedasticity. So I multiply on both sides of equation one by the weight variable, wi. Now, bear in mind, guys, hi is always going to be based on some observable variable. So this procedure wouldn't work if I didn't know the value of hi. So if I choose hi to be, if I choose h to be x1, then obviously I know the value of h because I know the value of x1. 
if I choose h to be x1 squared, then I know the value of h because I can observe x1 squared. So you have to choose h to be a function of something you can observe, typically one of the regressors. So once I've defined h, I then define w to be 1 over the square root, wi to be 1 over the square root of hi. And now I multiply on both sides of equation 1 by wi. So this is my transformed model. And the thing to note about the transformed model is that the error term in the transformed model, wi times ui, is going to be homoscedastic. Now, it's probably not obvious to you by looking at equation 2 that the error term wi hi is homoscedastic. So I'll go back to my own lecture notes and show you why that's the case in a moment, but just take my word for it for the, for the time being. So this is my transformed uh, model. The error term in the transformed model is homoscedastic. And here's a, a key point to note, guys. What about the betas in equation 2? Beta naught, beta 1, beta 2 to beta k. They're exactly the same betas that showed up in my original model. Beta naught, beta 1, beta 2, beta k. So when I estimate equation 2 by OLS, beta naught hat, for example, will be an estimator of beta naught. Beta 1 hat will be an estimator of beta 1, and so on. So it's critical that the betas that show up in my transformed equation are exactly the same as the betas in my original equation. So the error term in equation 2 is homoscedastic. So equation 2 satisfies all the assumptions of the Gauss-Markov theorem. So if I estimate equation 2 by OLS, the OLS estimator is going to be the best linear unbiased estimator. So this particular estimator is sometimes referred to as the weighted least squares estimator because you're weighting the dependent variable and each of the x's by this variable, wi. So this is the weighted least squares um, estimator. So now we're going to go back and estimate this financial, that financial wealth equation. Um, by weighted least squares. So, the, so at step one, to perform feasible GLS or weighted least squares, the first thing we have to do is we have to decide how we're going to define the variable HI. So here, we're going to define the variable HI to be income. So we're, here's the, the, remember I told you that to use feasible GLS at the very outset, you have to make an heroic assumption. You have to make an assumption about what's causing the heteroscedasticity in the error term. So here we're going to assume that the variance of ui is equal to sigma squared times income. So here I'm setting, in this, I'm going to set hi equal to the ith observation on income. So my h variable is going to be income. wi is 1 over the square root of income. So when you want to um, perform this procedure in eViews, as you will see when you have your, your tutorial exercise on heteroscedasticity, you have to create the variable wi. So to do that in the Jenner series window, you just write, uh, type wi equals 1 on a square root income and click on OK, and when you do that, you'll have a new variable wi in your work file directory. Because when you go to eViews and you want to estimate by weighted least squares, you have to tell eViews what variable you're going to use as wi. You have to enter wi as the weight variable, so you have to create it first. So um, the transformed model is going to be the original model multiplied by 
um, w. So here is the output we get when we estimate the model by weighted least squares using um, income as our h variable. These are the estimated coefficients, the standard errors, the t-stats, etc. And as I say, the, because the error term in the transformed model is well behaved, the OLS estimator of the betas in equation 2 will be blue, and hypothesis testing based on these standard errors and test statistics will be uh, reliable, because we've gotten rid of the heteroscedasticity problem. At step 1, it's actually, you could really think of it as a three-step procedure here. At step 1, you choose HI. At step 2, you transform the original model by multiplying on both sides by WI to get rid of the heteroscedasticity. And then at step 3, you, multi you estimate the transformed model by OLS. So here's the thing that we, in Eads use has a, a built-in weighted least squares command. So you click on the options tab. Where are my glasses? Here they are. So here um, you click on the options tab and in this weights window you choose inverse standard deviation because here our W variable is the inverse of the standard deviation of income. And then you have to tell EVUs what the weight variable is. So the weight variable is W. That's why, I am, as I mentioned previously, you have to create this variable W first before you can perform weighted least squares. And then you click on OK, and you get the estimated output. OK. So, a couple of things. I'll just finish these. Finish addressing these points in Farshid's notes, and then I'll go back to show you why the error term in the transformed model is homoscedastic. It's not obvious by looking at this equation that the error term is homoscedastic. So I'll go through that in a bit more detail. So um, the final point, a few final points Farshid makes here is that heteroscedasticity can arise in time series data as well as cross-sectional data, but it's much more common in time series data. So once upon a time, when people uh, found evidence of heteroscedasticity in the, in the, in the, uh, the error term, they would use weighted least squares because they didn't have any other option. Right? They didn't have any other option because they know that they knew not alone is the OLS estimator uh, a biased, um, sorry, the OLS estimator is inefficient, but hypothesis tests that are constructed using the OLS standard errors are unreliable. So until Hal White came along, with his heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors, the um, standard response to dealing with heteroscedasticity was to use weighted least squares. So at step one, you'd make an assumption about what was causing the heteroscedasticity. So in other words, you choose your H variable. At step two, you transform the original model to get rid of the heteroscedasticity. And then at step three, you would estimate the transformed model by OLS. And because the error term in the transformed model is well behaved, OLS applied to the transformed model is a best linear unbiased estimator. And hypothesis tests using the OLS standard errors from the transformed model are reliable. The problem is step one, choosing a particular variable, H. Um, to assume that we know what's causing the heteroscedasticity in the error is a very brave assumption. And basically, now that we have an alternative to using feasible GLS, it's um, not common for people to use this feasible GLS or weighted least squares procedure because you have to make this heroic assumption. And if the assumption about what's generating the heteros heteroscedasticity is incorrect, then 
your weighted least squares estimator is not going to be uh, a best linear unbiased estimator and your hypothesis tests are not going to be reliable. So these days, as I've already mentioned, what people typically do when they find evidence of heteroscedasticity is they say, okay, I'll estimate my equation by OLS. I'll accept that the OLS estimator is not the most efficient estimator, but I'll use White's heteroscedastic standard errors in order to do my hypothesis tests. And the great thing about White's heteroscedastic standard errors is you don't need to make an assumption about what's generating the heteroscedasticity in order to derive his uh, White's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors. Okay, so I'll try and show you why the weighted least squares estimation procedure works. So I'll just go back to these lecture notes here. Okay, so weighted least squares. So suppose that I have a simple model where I've got two x's, x1 and x2. So obviously to use um, feasible GLS or weighted least squares, I have to make an assumption about what's generating the heteroscedasticity. So I'm going to assume that the conditional variance of ui is equal to sigma squared xi1 squared. So I'm choosing as my hi variable xi1 squared. Now again, I emphasize, you know, that's a very, very heroic assumption to make. So the first thing I, I, I do now is I create my w variable. So wi is just 1 over the square root of hi. So it's 1 over xi1 squared, which is 1 over xi1. So my weight variable wi is just 1 divided by xi1. So step one, I've chosen my h variable. Step two, I now transform the original equation by multiplying on both sides of equation one by the variable wi. Remember, wi is just one on xi1. So multiplying on both sides of equation one by wi gets me to here. Now I'm just subbing in the definition of wi. It's one on xi1. And notice here that they kill each other. Right? When I multiply um, xi1 by wi, I just get a big fat 1. And then subbing in the definition of wi, I get this expression here. So this is my transformed model. And obviously, we can write the transformed model using a more compact notation. So I'll define wi times yi to be yi star. This guy here, 1 on xi1, that's just wi. This is now the intercept, beta 1. And I'll call this variable here, xi2 divided by xi1. I'll call that xi2 star. So this is just the ith observation on x2 divided by the ith observation on x1. And then this is the error term in my transformed model, ui star. So there's my original model, equation 1. I assume that hi is xi1 squared, and that gives me my transformed model, equation 2. Notice that the coefficients in equation 2 are exactly the same as the coefficients in equation 1. Beta naught, beta naught, beta 1, beta 1, beta 2, beta 2. So when I estimate equation 2 by OLS, I'm going to get estimates of the coefficients of interest, beta naught, beta 1, and beta 2. So the last thing it remains to show is that the variance of ui star, that the, the error term ui star is homoscedastic. So we need to show that the variance of ui star is a constant. Okay, so the variance by, by definition, var ui star, is going to be the variance of ui divided by xi1. That's the, here's my definition, right? There's my, I got ui star by dividing ui by xi1. So for ui star, I sub in ui divided by xi1. 
remember, we're talking about the conditional variance. So given that we're conditioning on x1 and x2, xi1 is a constant. So this is going to be the variance of a constant times ui. Remember the, remember the variance of ax is a squared times far x. So because we're conditioning on x1 here, I'm treating x1 as a constant. So I can take this guy here. This is the variance of um, a constant times ui. So that's going to be 1 on xi1 squared by the variance of, the conditional variance of ui. Well, what do we know about the conditional variance of ui? Well, we assumed the conditional variance of ui was sigma squared xi1 squared. That was my heroic assumption. So now, for the conditional variance of ui, I'm going to sub in sigma squared xi1 squared. So for the conditional variance of ui, I sub in xi1 squared times sigma squared. Those guys kill each other, and we're left with sigma squared. So the conditional variance of the error term in my transformed model Model equation two is homoscedastic. So that means that equation two satisfies all the assumptions of the Gauss-Markov theorem. And so when I estimate equation two by, OL, by OLS, the OLS estimator of equation two is going to be blue. The OLS estimator of equation one, that's definitely not blue because the error term in equation one is heteroscedastic. But boys and girls, the error term in equation 2, by construction, is homoscedastic, as we've just seen. So OLS applied to equation 2 is going to be a best linear unbiased estimator. And as I've already said, I'm, I'm rambling on, on here like an old man, but the big problem with feasible GLS or weighted least squares is that at the outset you have to make a big fat assumption about what's causing the heteroscedasticity in the error term. And if that assumption is incorrect, then the whole, uh, pro the whole estimation procedure breaks down. So that's why in modern applied econometrics, rather than use weighted least squares when, the, when people have find evidence of heteroscedasticity, uh, researchers prefer to simply estimate by OLS, accept that the OLS estimator is not the most efficient, and then use White's heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors to construct the test statistics for your hypothesis tests. And um, those hypothesis tests based on Uncle Hal's standard errors are valid in large samples. Whew, that's a lot. Oh, by the way, in case you've, I don't know, forgot, nearly forgot to tell you, so I uploaded assignment two to Moodle on the weekend. I was getting lots of emails from students who were saying they were really bored, they had nothing to do. Could you please put up an assignment and could you please make it a bit harder than assignment one? Assignment one was so easy. Can you make it harder, please? So this is a consumer driven unit, and so I responded to your requests as best I could. Okay, I'm starting to go a little bit crazy here because I've been in this room on my own talking to myself for two hours. So I think I better, I can hear the men in white coats approaching the door, so I think I better get my stuff and get out of here. Okay, that's it for today.